Chris, do you think we can get started and have him join us a little bit later? I guess so, yeah. All right. In that case, I'd like to welcome everyone. Thanks for joining Preservation Connecticut. We're doing a new, an, a fall series of talking about preservation. Um, and today we're gonna open up with a discussion on preservation easements. We've been really enjoying these noontime chats with about various preservation topics. And we're glad that you've decided to pop in and learn about preservation easements. And please feel free to use the chat for any questions and be sure to contact us also for any suggestions of other topics that you'd like to learn about. So today on the call we have, oops, <laughs> I'm Jane Montanaro, Executive Director of Preservation Connecticut. Chris Wiegren, our Deputy Director, will be presenting the program on easements. He's our easements coordinator here. And we also have Stacey Barrow, one of our circuit riders on staff, who is our circuit riders are our field service um, representatives who answer all the preservation calls that come in and they're immediately dis dispersed out into the field to work with homeowners, municipalities, developers, nonprofit organizations, anyone who is a steward of a historic property and needs some guidance. So be sure to always contact us for circuit riders and technical assistance. So Preservation Connecticut, for those of you who don't know us, we are the statewide nonprofit historic preservation organization. We were established in 1975 by a special act of the Connecticut General Assembly to protect, preserve, and promote the buildings, sites, and landscapes that contribute to the heritage and vitality of Connecticut communities. And part of our mission is providing education programs such as this talking about preservation. And um, we maintain a database of other professions in the other professionals in the field of historic preservation. And we provide um, guidance on tax credits historic tax credits, grants, advocacy, um, best practices for restoration, you name it, anything to do with preservation in Connecticut, we are your source. And go to the next slide. So that brings us to our discussion on easement properties. Um, Chris Wiegren, our Deputy Director, as I said, is the administrator of our easement program. So I will let Chris take it from here. Thank you, Jane. It's good to be here, whatever here is these days. Um, in the preservation world, how often is it that we hear about a battle to save a building from demolition and rejoice and celebrate the, the victory in that and then 20 or 30 years later find out that the same building is facing a demolition yet again and we have to start all over from the start and today we're going to talk about one way to help prevent that sort of cycle of, of battles and threats uh, specifically preservation easements Preservation easement, um, sometimes you'll also hear it referred to as preservation restrictions or a stewardship agreement. It's a legal agreement that a property owner uh, makes with a separate body and organization like Preservation Connecticut. Uh, in Connecticut, there are also some local preservation organizations that hold preservation easements. There are regional organizations like Historic New England um, to basically sign over certain rights to the land. In that way, it's sort of like an easement that gives access, say, for a driveway or an, elect an electric line. Um, land trusts also engage in easement to preserve, to preserve land. The usual restrictions involved in a preservation easement include uh, the requirement that the easement holder, the easement holding organization, 
has to approve alterations to features that are covered by the easement uh, and also require maintenance. And those two items really are basically what an easement is all about. And everything else is uh, features that, that help to preserve, to carry out those two, those two functions. Easements can be made for a specific period of time, or they can be made perpetual. They just, you know, will go as long as, as, long as the property remains in existence. Um, but in any case, they go with the land so that if the property changes owners, the easement still applies to subsequent owners of the property. So Preservation Connecticut has easements on more than 30 properties around the state, um, different kinds of properties. A lot of them are for houses. We'll see some here. Uh, some of them are quite grand. Some of them are much more modest. But we have easements in other kinds of places as well. We have apartments like this reconverted thread mill in Pawkintuck, farmsteads like the Osborne Farm in Southbury, commercial buildings in downtown New Haven, um, and condos, in this case in Norwich, uh, converted from uh, historic mill, uh, mill worker housing. Some of our easements are a little bit more unusual. This is a cider mill in Guilford. And in this case, the easement not only protects the physical building, uh, but also some of this equipment inside of it that has been in place since the 19th century uh, used for making cider. And easements can cover landscapes, land, as you've heard, conservation easements. Um, the Lebanon Historical Society has an easement on the Lebanon Town Green, uh, the biggest green in Connecticut. It's a mile long, and a lot of it is, is very unimproved looking, so it's almost a natural landscape. Some of it is used as hayfield by neighboring farmers. Uh, some of it is used for town events as well. And uh, we're proud to be in a second position to assist the Lebanon Historical Society with the easement to protect this wonderful historic landscape. So what kinds of things in a property will an easement protect? Um, we usually start with the exterior. Almost all our easements cover the entire exterior of the building. And we'll, here you see the former SNET headquarters in New Haven, which has been converted to an apartment building. Uh, in the case of this building, uh, the easement also covers the lobby. You can see what a marvelous space that is, this Art Deco ornamentation. Um, some of the houses include uh, interior features that are protected by the easements. Um, and of course, as you saw with that cider mill, the, the cider making equipment, which is physically attached to the building. So it's almost, a, almost part of the architecture, but also really what that building is all about. Beyond main buildings, we have easements that cover outbuildings like the barn at the church farm in Ashford on the upper right there. And um, also on the Avery homestead in Ledger, you can see some barns and outbuildings that are included as well as that big open field. This is a place that has been a farm since the 17th century. And so the sense of the open farmland around the house is an important part of its historic character. And so the easement requires that the field be kept open, that it not be allowed to grow up into woodland as Connecticut fields tend to do if left to their own devices. Um, and we've included such things such as the landscape elements, the wall and the fence and the little gazebo at Marlborough House in Bristol. Can I make changes? to my property to suit modern needs. The whole idea of an easement is to let the property have an ongoing life and use. We're not turning it into a museum, we're not freezing it in amber, but we're making sure that any changes that happen are done in ways that protect the historic character of the building. So here's the Benjamin Weed House in Darien, uh, which has an easement on it, and you can see 
addition on the right that was built uh, with review and approval from Preservation Connecticut to make, keep it set back so that the house, uh, the original house sort of has the pride of place. In addition to regulating changes and requiring maintenance, uh, we try to maintain an ongoing relationship with property owners. Uh, this is a church farm again, which is owned by the uh, Eastern Connecticut State University Foundation associated with ECSU. And so uh, here I am with uh, one of our board members, Ed Gerber, who you'll hear from later, uh, meeting with one of the guys from ECSU who's in charge of overseeing the property. We can offer advice and guidance. We can help them set priorities when you have a place that needs several things done at once, which is the most important one to do first. Uh, we can help point them to methods of dealing with, with, with structural problems. We can offer suggestions about ways to, um, you know, alter or maintain the building. Um, we can offer advice for features that are not re re regulated by the easement as well. You know, we don't, if they, if, even if the interior is not covered by the easement, we're there to help provide advice about changes that might need to be made to the interior or ways, say, of installing um, infrastructure things such as electricity or plumbing or air conditioning. Um, to um, help you get sort of the owner's view of things, uh, one of our board members, Ed Gerber, is on the call this morning. He has given us an easement on his house in Westport. So Ed, welcome. Tell us about your you. experience with preservation easements. Thanks, Chris. I, I, I could I, if I'd just like to start that if anyone on the line is interested in, in doing this, uh, Chris is, is, is an amazing, amazing resource. He, he's worked on every single easement that we have and um, uh, it, he just works, he, he makes it so easy, I guess is the best way to, to put it. Um, well, this uh, was actually my second easement. I gave an easement on a property many, many years ago in Washington, D.C. and it was a, a little different. It was a requirement uh, with the with my purchase of the property, I had to give an easement on it, but I was, of course, in favor of it. And the reason for that easement was that the property was very, very close to the main gates of a university in Washington. And the fear of the community was that the university was going to move out <coughs> and grab all the properties uh, adjacent to it. So by giving an easement on it, we protected it. And even though now, many years later, it is owned by the university, they, um, are required to maintain it and uh, to maintain it as a residence. So, and they have done done so. So I, I think that's, I think that was great. Um, when, when I bought this house, which was owned by <clears throat> my godparents and I spent my whole life in it, I um, quickly learned after moving to Westport in 10 years ago, that Westport was the teardown capital of Connecticut. And this property has an acre and a half on the sort of in a prime spot. So it was very, the developers were salivating when my godmother died. <laughs> but I, um, I, you know, I bought it and immediately uh, had it locally designated as, as a local historic landmark. But that only goes so far. And we've had experience in recent years showing how limited that is, unfortunately. So Chris and I discussed, Chris said, what would you like to do? What would you like to protect? You, you tell me what you want to do. And I said that I wanted to protect, of course, the house. Um, to the right, we can see the garage. And then also, um, there's a building to the left, which was the artist's studio. The, the house was owned by an artist for and his family for 100 years. So keeping the studio and the house together was crucial for me for the future of the house. And so the, the easement was written up so that the property cannot be subdivided. Um, so that, you know, that really uh, was what I wanted. The other thing was that the local designation only protected what you can see from the street. And that's basically what we're looking at here. What about the back and what about some of the sides? So the, our current easement with um, 
uh, Preservation Connecticut requires that any alterations that I, I or future owners want to make um, have to be uh, submitted to uh, Preservation Connecticut. Not always Chris. Chris won't always be there forever, but <laughs> the, new, the new Chris <laughs> to, uh, to review and, and give an opinion on and approve or suggest changes. So again, it makes it a little tighter than it was before. The other thing that the house has that, that's kind of special is um, a series of interconnecting um, stone walls that have been there for many, many, many years. And I've seen what's happened with stone walls in some, um, some houses that have been torn down by developers. You know, they're basically bulldozed. So they are protected as well. So that's exactly what I wanted. And um, thank you, Chris, for um, facilitating it. Thank you for showing that real people can do this. Um, <laughs> And Ed, incidentally, is so enthusiastic about this, he's now chair of our easements committee. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really great. That has been a, an amazing experience for me because I'm going around with, R Renee, is Renee on the line? Yes. yes. With Renee, Renee Tr Trebert and, and, and Chris, yeah. and, and we're looking at every single easement. We're doing what Chris mentioned earlier. We're doing uh, inspections, annual inspections, semi-annual inspections of all of the properties for which we have easements, basically to, to uh, check on their condition. How do we know down here, in, or how do you know in, in Hamden, how the uh, properties are being maintained? So it's very important that we do that. And Renee writes a very uh, uh, tough letter to the homeowner saying, look, this is what you need to do. And, um, and that's important. Well, that's, I, that's one thing I mentioned, I forgot to mention and why I did it. Um, was because uh, Historic uh, Preservation Connecticut has the ability to say to me or to a future owner, look, there's a hole in your roof, water's coming into the house, you need to repair it, and you need to do it by X date. And if you don't, we will come in, we will repair it, and we will file a lien against you, uh, to, uh, which will go with with the uh, in the land records of the house and will have to be tended to should you should you decide to sell the house so again it's a little stronger way of pre preserving a historic house thanks yeah yeah the, the, I didn't make a slide for this but just some of the differences of different types of uh, preservation designations I mean listing on the National Register or the State Register are primarily honorific and uh, planning tools, and they don't really give you protections. Mm -hmm. um, local historic districts, local historic properties do put regulations on it, but as Ed said, they only cover what you can see from the street, um, and they can't prevent subdividing property sometimes in cases where the property is important. You know, the land, the outbuildings are important to the, to the historic character of the property. Like that big field that I showed you at the Avery Homestead. So an easement gives you a good deal more flexibility in defining your terms, exactly what you want protected and how you want them done. Um, so what's the process? Uh, first of all, is determining if the property is is significant. Is it important? Is it worth putting these restrictions on to protect it? Um, we usually require that properties be listed on the National Register. Uh, sometimes the State Register listing will do if it's well documented. You have to, of course, we have to confirm the ownership. Um, and then we really get down to talk about what exactly are you concerned about? What exactly is important to this property? What exactly should be covered? Uh, is it the outside only of the buildings? Would it be some of the interiors as well? Uh, do we want to make provisions to allow or forbid additions to a building? Um, do we want to allow or forbid subdividing the property? And sometimes you can spell out, you know, well, you can build an addition, but it can't be more than so many square feet, or it can't be taller than the original building, or it has to be on the back and not on the side. Um, so you can predetermine some of the alterations that will happen. Uh, we negotiate the document and um, sign it. Here we have uh, a signing 
celebration with uh, the family of the Elliot Moyes House. Well-known architect, modernist architect in New Canaan, designed this house for himself and his family, uh, and his children gave us an easement on the property uh, not long ago. There are some costs involved with it. Uh, owners frequently want an attorney to uh, look over uh, the agreement to make sure that it's in their interest. Um, sometimes an appraisal needs to be done. Um, and then also we ask for a one-time donation to Preservation Connecticut, 1% uh, of the value of the property. And that helps fund our ongoing uh, administration of the easement, making, making annual trips to, to visit the property, to meet with property owners, uh, to follow up with uh, advice and recommendations and reports as needed. Um, if necessary, you know, we might at some point have to go, to go to court to enforce an easement. We haven't had to do that yet, but um, it's a possibility. And of course, lawsuits cost money. Uh, so that, that donation helps fund our activities. Uh, and you know, all of our, all the easements that we currently hold are forever. So that's a long time to be committed to doing this. There is the possibility in some cases uh, for tax benefits to donors of easements. Um, if the property is listed on the National Register, if a qualified appraisal shows that the easement reduces the value of the property, uh, that can be treated like a charitable do donation. Uh, to the to preservation Connecticut, and of course, in that case, you do have, to have a an appraisal done. You might get audited as well, uh, but there is that benefit that you get uh, for donating an easement. But the main benefit, the main reason for doing that, is not for a tax deduction. In mo for most people, the main reason really is peace of mind, knowing that this important historic property that we've taken care of for many years, in a lot of cases, uh, will continue to be properly taken care of and continue to be uh, an asset to the community in which it is located. Uh, so that's the basics about preservation easements and uh, we can open it up now to questions and answers. Uh, questions at any rate. <laughs> Um, Chris, this is Renee, mm -hmm. and and if I may, I would just like to kind of uh, address one thing. Um, so Ed mentioned that after our inspections, we write um, sometimes tough letters, but I do want to point out that um, our goal is to work with owners to protect the building. So we, um, you know, we're not trying to be confrontational or uh, aggressive. We just want to work together to see that the building is uh, safely preserved. Yeah, uh, Renee, Renee works for Preservation Connecticut and she, she does a lot of the easement inspections. Um, and maybe it would be better to characterize her letters as firm rather than tough. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that, I mean, and really the point is that, that we're, we're a partner and we hope that property owners will see us as a partner who can give them assistance as well as telling them what they can and can't do. Uh, the, the, the goal here for everyone is to ensure that these properties are kept in good repair um, and continue to be uh, historic assets to their communities. Well, Chris, this is Ed. I might, I might change my opinion after she reviews my house and sends <laughs> me a letter. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, Chris, did I hear you say that some easements are given uh, not in perpetuity, but for a specific time period? Yeah, those generally, um, the state of Connecticut does that when it gives a restoration grant to a fund. Oh, right. Uh, and we did that when we used to have a revolving fund. Um, we would make an investment in the property <laughs> and ask for an easement to protect our investment, but it didn't seem that it was quite reasonable to impose uh, these restrictions forever. 
uh, on the, in these cases. So those, those easements uh, had it came with an expiration date and the state restoration fund easements come with an expiration date. I think it's usually about 10 or 15 years. It depends on how much, how big the grant mm. is that you get. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Have any come through in the chat? Uh, hi, this is Jack Hale from Church of the Good Shepherd in Hartford. Uh, hi, Jack. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, we, uh, we are in a rather slow process to grant a preservation easement in perpetuity to the National Park Service as the Coltsville National Historical Park is developed. Uh, my, my concern in this case we're, we're, is that uh, we will continue to operate as a church uh, with this preservation easement in place. And uh, I'm concerned about identifying any uh, areas that we ought to be uh, concerned about. I, I did run into one organization that had granted a preservation easement to the uh, Park Service that ran into trouble over that uh, 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 opportunity for the easement holder to make repairs if the property owner does not do them. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the problem was that uh, the property owner was not getting it done because they had a, a, a thought about how it should be done. And they were not able to do that yet. Uh, and the Park Service had a different idea about the, the way to uh, do those repairs that was unsatisfactory to the property owner. Uh, and uh, they just went ahead and the Park Service went ahead and made those repairs and <laughs> in spite of the uh, concerns of the property owner. So the, I, I've identified that as a potential pitfall uh, in granting a preservation easement. Um, but I'm wondering whether there are other things we ought to be uh, thinking about. Hmm. I, uh, I, um, I'm not familiar with the park services easements, how they're, how they're um, structured or um, what powers they have. Um, um, we could talk about this separately if, if it goes farther. I mean, thinking about just ways the church uses the building, um, you know, and, and what, how that might be restricted under the under the terms of the easement. Um, I don't know how many other people there are, you know, you've been able to find who have experience with park service easements. Um, we've never actually gone in, had to go in and do repair um, that way um, with ahead of the property owner, um, but that's still always there as, a, as an option. Um, I don't know if there's some way of inserting language that that would only be done after some kind of, uh, most e easement agreements I think include some kind of um, arbitration or, or mediation uh, process. You know, maybe, maybe you ask that that be included in the, that that, that be addressed bef before the Park Service comes in to actually do any work. Um, barring emergency perhaps, um, you know, a real structural emergency. Um, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. There are lots of organizations around the country that have, have uh, uh, granted easements to the National Park Service uh, for various purposes. Uh, mm -hmm. It just happened. Connecticut ha is very lean in the national park business. Uh, uh, there's only one that's yeah. actual yeah. actually in place, the Weir Farm. But mm -hmm. uh, if you go to Boston or you go to 
Baltimore or different other places around the country, there there are lots of churches and other institutions that have granted easements. Anyone else have any questions for Chris? Chris? Yes. Hi, this is Andy. Just had a question. Um, I, I'm under the impression that the vast, vast majority of the easements pretty much address the exterior. You did mention the uh, lobby of the uh, SNAT building in New Haven. Do you, do you have any other uh, in your easement portfolio that were, were they, uh, were any parts of the interior protected? I noticed you mentioned the cider mill thing in the, in the equipment, but what about the, uh, any other properties? Um, yeah, we have a, we have a couple of houses. Um, I think they're both 18th century houses. Uh, the Avery homestead that uh, we showed with the farmland around it. Uh, some of the interiors are covered by the easement in that, in that case. Um, and also there's another 18th century house in East Haven uh, where we have an easement that covers some of the interiors as well. And generally those spell out, you know, floorboards, uh, framing, framing members, paneling, fireplaces, stair, stair rails, that, that kind of thing. They generally tend to be sort of the front formal rooms um, rather than kitchens and bathrooms, obviously. Uh, but most of our, the vast majority of our easements only cover exteriors of buildings. Uh, and that's something that varies from organization to organization. Uh, some organizations will not deal with interiors at all. That's just too sort of invasive. Um, some organizations require that their easements cover everything, you know, and, and then they just sort of have guidelines for being more lenient in some case, in some kinds of spaces than others. Um, so it's, sort of in some ways our, our organizational preference, um, but also uh, the preferences of the property owners. There's a concern that if you put too, the more restrictions you put on a property, the more difficult it might be to sell it. Um, a number of our easement properties have successfully sold and changed hands and, and you know, found good second and third generation owners who are just as committed to the preservation of the properties as the original easement donors were. Uh, but still, you know, it, it, it's, it makes a sort of specialized old building market a little bit narrower still when, you're try when you put restrictions on a building. Uh, so it's something something to think about. You know, they, they'll sell, but they might take longer. Um, and they'll sell, but they might bring a bit less just because the owner realizes, the buyer realizes they're going to have to deal not only with the property, but with uh, Preservation Connecticut as well. Okay. Thank you. But, but you see, for me, I think of it as an honor. I think it's increased the value. <laughs> And we've talked about uh, plaques. Um, where are we with that process? <laughs> I've forgotten. You know, the idea of putting a plaque on the house with, that would tell the world that this mm -hmm. property, uh, the, uh, the owner has given an easement to Preservation Connecticut. Um, and we just have to finalize the design on that and put the order in. <laughs> okay. And, and it's not a requirement that, that each... Uh, donor uh, puts the plaque on their property, right? We're not requiring them to do it. Um, we haven't. Yeah. Um, we would like to, to do that because then there is a, a physical sure. reminder on the house that, on the building, that there is a preservation easement. Um, right. He said as properties transfer to new owners, it there may be a lapse in time before people realize 
<laughs> that Preservation Connecticut is here to do an inspection. <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> and exactly. Actually, yeah. actually, yeah. actually, I think the the the, mo the the model document we have we have a base document that we start with and we use we can modify that to meet the needs of specific properties. But I think the model we're using now says that if we want to put a plaque on a building with an easement on it, we're allowed to. And I think the owner has agreed by, by signing the easement has agreed to that. Ah, great. Um, Chris, through the years, have we, have we said no to anyone who uh, wanted to give us an easement? Uh, yes, we have. Um, there have been a couple of properties that just didn't seem to rise to the level of importance. Mm -hmm. uh, buildings that had been very, very much altered in ways that did not add to their historic significance. Mm -hmm. um, and at the other end of the spectrum, actually, we had one person we were talking to who wanted to restrict everything down to interior paint colors and oh, right. practically which which direction the screws screw head slots and the screw heads pointed <laughs> uh, <laughs> she she really wanted you know to be watching over every single detail of that house for from up in the sky or wherever she was forever and ever uh, and and we just didn't think that was reasonable and we kept try suggesting modifications. We, we never actually said no, but she decided that she wasn't interested in working with us. I wonder if she found another uh, organization who would take the, the easement, that restrict restrictive easement. I, I believe she did find somebody else to do an easement, whether they, you know, finally wore her down or not. I don't know what the exact <laughs> terms were. <but. laughs> Interesting, thank you. Uh, this is Jack again. Uh, what we have at the church, we have sort of a different view on what easements are for, or, in our, from, from our point of view. Um, and from my point of view personally, having put a lot of time and energy into maintenance and restoration of the building as it is, or the buildings as they are today, uh, I view the easement as a way to uh, protect that that investment uh, that we have made. Um, in particular, in a in the case of a church, uh, the institutions are often a, under economic pressure uh, to try to do things on the cheap and to have uh, an easement holder who has some oversight of how work is done on the structures uh, is comforting as we, as we do major repairs and restoration and renovation work now. And the, the trick of course, is how you structure that into the, the easement itself. Um, so you don't want to sit, tell the National Park Service that they have rent have uh, review and approval of every change uh, because then every light bulb can be, can become an issue. Uh, so, so one of the challenges we face is trying to figure out uh, how to define what is uh, appropriate consideration for National Park Service oversight and what what should be viewed as uh, uh, normal maintenance or or uh, or whatever, uh, and and that's that's something I think we are, we are still struggling with to figure out. the The Park Service originally said we don't have any interest in the interior, and <laughs> I I said that's crazy. You know, if you've ever been inside these buildings, you know that the interior needs to be uh, maintained. Uh, but the question is, what's the what's the level of uh, concern they should have, and how to define that? And I'm uh, we're still we're still puzzling about that one. 
you know, the, the Park Service, of course, works off of the Secretary of the Interior standards, uh, which does have guidance about, you know, replacement materials, for instance, you know, what's, what's, what's re regular maintenance and what's rehabilitation, what's, what's the kind of work that sort of rises to the level of, of uh, review and approval, um, which is used, you know, certainly in, in approving tax credits for renovation work. Um, so the, and, and I, I would assume that that's probably since they since they wrote the secretary's standards, I assume that the, that's what they're going to use as their guidance for administering an easement. Jack, are the other property owners at Coltsville Park also talking with the Park Service about easements? Uh, yeah, um, but I don't know. I don't know the extent of of that conversation. Uh, there are the the circumstances for each property owner is quite different. Um, so, and and also the the level of engagement with the park service varies quite a bit. So we'll see how that proceeds. It's not, at this point, it's not an urgent issue for the park service. So um, every time anybody has any kind of conversation, it goes around and around the, the uh, federal infrastructure before you, you get a response. So it's pretty slow. Hey, Todd, you had a question? Yeah, I'm sorry I got in here so late, but uh, my, my, my question, and this has probably been covered, but I want to ask it anyway. Uh, I know that you can do an easement on a national, nationally listed uh, property, but can you do one on a state listed property? Um, we, we will accept easements on state registered properties. We hope, we look for a designation that that's fairly well detailed. That's got um, a lot of the early state register listings were just kind of, you know, everything that's on this windshield survey list uh, gets automatic right. state register designation there. So uh, we would we would ask that uh, there be a fair level of significance demonstrated and, and documented uh, for a state register listed property. So a recent a recent nomination would be good. Usually, usually a recent one will will be fine. Yeah. And and my and of other course, question if you're looking is, for say if you're uh, looking for tax benefits, then it has to be on the national register. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, and I know this was answered before, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, it, what are the costs in, in involved? Um. The, the cost of certainly attorney's fees, accountant's fees for the, for the donor. If um, you're looking for tax benefits, you have to have an appraisal done, so you'd be responsible for that. Um, for Preservation Connecticut, we have an application fee, which I believe is $800. And um, then we add, the big thing is we ask for a donation that's 1% of the appraised value of the property. Um, uh, to fund our maintenance administration uh, fund. Um, and so, you know, that, and if you don't have an appraisal done, we've got the town appraisal for tax purposes where we'll use that. All right, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from questions. the group? Go ahead. Thought someone had a question. Well, 
next week we're going to be welcoming Dr. Leah Glazer from Central Connecticut State University. She'll be talking about the graduate program in public history there um, and her thoughts on the preservation, the future of our field, historic preservation, and it should be a really great conversation. She's a, a, a great uh, asset to Connecticut and educating the young and up and coming preservationists. So we look forward to talking with her and we hope that many of you can join us next week. Thank you so much for being with us today. And if you're not a member of Preservation Connecticut, please become a member today. Thank you. Thank there you. was one question that came through on the chat. Um, yeah. Does, it, oh. does the town appraisal apply to nonprofits? Um, I assume that means that if the nonprofit is, that's just, you know, if, they, if they've got another appraisal done, we can look at that. It's just to save having an the cost of an appraisal um, if you're not looking for tax benefits, which nonprofits obviously, obviously wouldn't. Uh, we just need some way of determining the value of the property so the town the town appraisal is there. Does that answer your question? Yeah, because I was thinking like of churches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, they're not taxed. Right, right. And we do have a preservation easement on a museum, the Adam Stanton House and General Store in Clinton. So we do hold easement properties, easements on nonprofit organizations. And, and, okay. and town appraisers generally do appraise the value of properties, even if they're non, even if they're tax exempt. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So I apologize for being quick to wrap things up. <laughs> <laughs> Last chance if you have a question, please. <laughs> <laughs> Well, again, thank you all so much for joining us, and we hope to see you next week and for the remainder of our Talking About Preservation chat. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Ed. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. These are great.